Hello, everyone. Welcome to another exciting, informative, and otherwise entertaining SETI Live event. We're going to talk to one of the students who's been working here. My name is Seth Shostak. I'm an astronomer here at the SETI Institute. And I think you know something about the SETI Institute. We're interested in all uh, aspects of life in the universe. How can we find it? How might it arise? Things like that. And we're going to talk more about that last subject today with Carla Colon, who's an REU student. Now, REU is a research experience for undergraduates, and I hope it's been a good experience for Carla, where we have a, a typically 10 to 20 students in a summer who come in. They're undergraduates at various universities around the United States, and uh, they are assigned to a mentor, one of our scientists who give them a project, and they work on that during the summer. So let me introduce the dramatis personae. Uh, to begin with, there's Carla Colon. Hi, Carla. Hi. Okay. All right, Carla. Uh, uh, anyhow, she's working for Dave Summers, who I guess you would say is really a biochemist. Uh, he's associated with the SETI Institute, but also with the NASA Ames Research Center. Dave, good to see you. Hey, and for the record, we'll call me a chemist working on biological and geological problems. Okay, I did want to mischaracterize you there, Dave. So, <laughs> the chemist. All right, great. Uh, Carla, just to get us underway here, tell us where you're in school. Well, I am from Ana Jimenez University in Puerto Rico. I'm currently studying chemistry, and I gratefully was selected for this program this summer. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, so do you happen to have a photo of that university in Puerto Rico where you're in school? Yeah. I'll, Maybe you could let me just show that to us, yeah. It, yeah. So this is a... Well, there's, there's a nice picture of Puerto Rico there. Uh, which part of the <laughs> country is, or sorry, the... Island is the university located. Okay, sort of south of, uh, to there the <laughs> east of San Juan. Did I get that right? Yeah, if you can see my my cursor, I'm from Gurabo, which um, is uh, a little bit under San Juan. Uh, my university, it's a private institution. It first off started as a community college and it was started by this beautiful lady that's here. Her name is Ana Jimenez, Ana Grecia Mendez. And she was a pioneer. She was a woman that got her high school diploma at 27 years old, and she never stopped there. Um, education wasn't that uh, much of a big deal for women in Puerto Rico. So what she really did, even though it was like at 27, it was amazing and after that she started her passion was education and he got her she got her master's degree and she just said I'm gonna build uh, an institution I'm gonna build college for everyone that needs a degree and can get it and needs a future and that's this beautiful lady <laughs> what 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 year are you Carla and this is my senior year now I'm on my fourth year so you're a rising senior, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, well, let me ask you, what was the topic that uh, you and Dave came up with to, uh, to work on this summer? What was, what was the question you were trying to answer? Well, uh, it's basically we kind of like started with two, but it's more astrobiology um, based on the origin of life. And the project that I've been working this summer is based on gas chromatography and gas phase fluorescence to detect biomarkers. In our case, we're trying to um, detect fatty acids with the fluorescence technique. So if I understand this correctly, what you're trying to do is find some, if you will, fingerprint of biology that uh, you might recognize on another world, right? Exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, well, tell us a little bit about it. I mean, uh, you, you're talking about recognizing fatty acids. I don't even recognize them when they're in my diet. Uh, to, <laughs> you know, fatty acid, <laughs> name a, a common fatty acid so I have an idea what you're talking about. Well, one of the most uh, recognizable ones and the one that we're using is oleic acid. That's um, 
one of the biggest oleic acid. Service. Yeah. <laughs> I, I bet I have that at home in my refrigerator, do I? Yeah, like you you can just buy it anyway. <laughs> but but isn't it in, in some things I eat or not? It I is. yeah. Right. Dave? Yes, it is. Um, and in fact, I'm sure I've actually look, I haven't Googled this, but oleo is an old fashioned name for margarine. And I'm sure that root and oleic acid are linked. Okay. Another acid we didn't get around to studying was palmitic acid, which is from heart, palm hearts. So what, what is the function of ole, oleatic acid in, in, in my metabolism? What, what do I do with it? What, you know, do I make it, do I ingest it? And what does it do for me? Carla? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, well, since it's, it's a fatty acid, it's part of our, well, it's part of the membrane cells. It's usually, it makes, it's part of a very big process in our systems. So it's, it's more of like in, in the membrane cells. So, all right. So it's in the, you know, the outer structure of cells, right? Yeah. In fact, it, it makes up basically most of your membranes are, are fatty acids tied together into lipids. And one reason that makes it a biomarker, i.e. a marker for life, is that in fact, you do make it yourself. And you make it for yourself two carbons at a time, which means the fatty acids in you all tend to have an even number of carbons. In fact, very strongly have an even number of carbons. And that's considered a sign of life. Okay, and, and, and would we find these things in every kind of life? I mean, if I take a random bacterium off the table here, would it also have these acids? Um, everything but archaea. Okay. So everything but a certain class of bacteria. Okay, so... Everything you can see around you is like that. All right, so everything except the sort of the first forms of single-celled life here on Earth will have this. And so how do, how do you find it? I mean, if... if well, first is iffy, but yes. <laughs> okay, all right. But well, Carla, how do, how do you find these things? I mean, suppose, uh, you know, we send a... a a lander to Mars, for example, and it digs in the dirt. How does it know that there's any oleatic acid in there or not? Well, it, it's not one of these things that you just, um, it's not a specific life form. You don't see a structured living form there. Uh, it's, it's smaller, smaller than <laughs> what our eyes can can physically capture. So usually what we use is um, spectrometry, which is the, the one that we've been working uh, for this project. Um, so yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, by the way, we have uh, uh, people who are watching in, in London and in Surrey. So uh, uh, several in the UK, somebody in Denver here. So uh, it, it, explain to them, all right, you're going to use spectroscopy. So that means you're going to do what you, you scoop up a sample of some some soil on another world and now how do you search it for these biomarkers well everything is kind of um unique uh molecules have a unique um sort of mark in them so when we analyze with spectroscopy what we want is to like detect that specific um, signature that they emit. And based on, well, not, not really emit, but the, the, the specific signature that it's for them. So uh, what basically is just, we work with uh, wavelengths and how these compounds absorb and in our case, absorb and emit um, life in, well, energy in the form of light, photons, and that way we can really detect our fatty acids and the whole structure of our fatty acids. So it's on how they absorb, yeah. yeah. By the way, Carla, uh, as lovely as it is, I, I guess we'd rather look at you than um, Ms. Mendez. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's not talking to us. Um, I'll jump in real quick. I mean, there's, for an actual instrument sitting on a rover on Mars, there's a couple steps that would come before what Carla's working on. A colleague at NASA 
uh, Mary Beth Wilhelm is working on an extraction system which would take your soil from Mars and extract all the fatty acids out of it and give us a little residue sitting in a tube. And our job is to say, in that residue, are there, are there fatty acids? Yeah. You, but you have to find them when they're 35 million miles away. I mean, that's a whole trick here, right? Well, that's why you send the probe there. Yes. Right. Yes. yes, I understand. But, but these are not necessarily samples that are coming back eventually to Earth as some of the samples of the Perseverance rover are grabbing, right? The, these, this, is, this is not to be a lab experiment here on Earth. It's to be a, an experiment on, well, Mars in this case, or some other place, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you, <laughs> you, you, you do spectroscopy, uh, spectroscopy, but to do that normally, you know, the, the sample has to kind of light up. So you can use a, you know, a prism or something like a prism to split up the light and see the fingerprint of, of this acid. Um, how, do, how do you light it up? Um, well, it's more of a technique. Fatty acids don't usually um, present or, or possess much fluorescence uh, capabilities. Um, so in that, what we're trying to do is to der derivatize or in another, in a more um, digested form, is just to attach a fluorescing, um, a fluorescing molecule to the fatty acid so that we can really see that that molecule is there. So if I understand you, Carla, it sounds like you're doing sort of a chemical trick here. You're going to, if there is any of this acid in the, in the sample, you're gonna put another molecule in that you can then illuminate the whole sample with, I don't know, maybe ultraviolet light or something. And if it glows, then you found that molecule you attach to the oleatic acid. And if there's no such acid there, you don't see a glow. Oh well, yeah, that, you could see a glow, but really it's more of that glow that we are really trying to attach in that molecule. Um, so it'll have like an a specific form. Just to interject and comment on what fluorescence means. Some molecules, when you shine light on at one wavelength, will then glow with light at a different wavelength and that's fluorescence. And that's what we're attaching to the fatty acids, because as Carla said, they won't do that, but we can attach compounds that will. Okay, and, and, and how do you, I mean, just physically, how do you do that? I mean, if I were there on Mars with a, a camera and reporting what this, this lander or rover was doing, what would I see it do? Um, basically, the samples would come out of Dr. Wilhelm's thing and you'd inject some compounds into it. And they would go on a gas chromatograph, which basically just separates them out. And then we would find the amino acid with the fatty acid attached to it and detect it as Carla explained. Okay, Carla, let me ask you this. this is, uh, from a naive point of view, I mean, this is looking for an acid that we find in the membranes of cells here on earth. But could it be that, you know, uh, an alien membrane is really alien and it's built in a different way? Yeah, of course. That, what basically we're trying to do is to look for things that we know. We can't really look for things that we don't know. Of course, if we don't know them, we don't really know if we're identifying something that's valuable. Um, but that's sort of what basically what we're trying to look is more of other things that can make us understand from where we come from and how are we made. So if these molecules are in other places, that really means that, you know, something could really happen there. So, so you're not trying to prove a negative. I mean, if you don't see something, it doesn't mean there's no life there. But mm. if you do this experiment and you do see something, now you have reason to suspect that there's been some development of biology on these other worlds. Yeah, it's better than nothing. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I, I assume it's better than nothing. But, you know. I'll just interject. That's why people have heard the phrase searching for life as we know it. That's yes. why. Yes. Well, I think that's true of essentially all the experiments that have been sent to Mars to look for biology. They're all looking for something that is at least fairly similar to our own because that's all we know to look for. But uh, again, I mean, you, you're, you're making the bet 
that this kind of an experiment, if there's life on Mars, say, that this kind of experiment would find it, right? At least if it resembles earthly chemistry. Now, you know, is, is this the best way to find evidence for, you know, life on Mars? And, and would it find life that existed on Mars four billion years ago, or does it only work if there's still life on Mars? I think it's more based on what we know that's, that has worked. We here physically, we're here, we know that we worked. Um, <laughs> how we are constituted, we know that we worked. So we're trying to look for things that we already have evidence that has worked because that's why we're here. We're present, we're sitting down, we're interacting, we have this conscious and we are um, evolving. So we're trying to look for things. There might be other molecules, other type of um, indicators of life, uh, but we are very certain that these ones do work on to the level that they've created this, um, our organisms that are all around planet Earth, us, animals, other types of like, bacteria. But we do know that this <laughs> molecule does work. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, by the way, this this is this prompts me to remind the viewers that our next SETI talks will be about uh, trying to describe what life is. And you might think, oh, that's pretty trivial. I'll just grab my tenth grade biology textbook, and it says right there in the first chapter, you know, life uh, uh, metabolizes and it multiplies, and it, it you know it does all these things. But in fact, they don't apply to all kinds of life. I mean, you know, mules don't reproduce, for example, but you would never argue that they're not alive. So actually the definition of life is, you know, still up in the air in a way. Uh, maybe you just recognize it when you see it, but that's what this experiment would do. Is it going to actually be placed on anything that's going to Mars, for example? Carla? I've kind of lost you there for a moment. Oh, well, I mean, you know, this experiment to try and find these acids, is it going to be sent anywhere? I mean, you know, you, you, you'll you define a way to do this and uh, maybe you say something about how sensitive it is and so forth, but is it something that could be actually put on a rocket and sent somewhere else? Yeah, that's um, one of the biggest benefits of using gas chromatography and gas phase fluorescence. Um, it's supposed, well, it is of uh, lightweight compared to other um, separation techniques and compared to other um, spectrometers. So that's one of the the, the biggest um, attributes that this whole project has. Okay, so uh, are there any def uh, definite plans? Maybe this is for, for Dave, but I mean, is there any particular mission to any other world where you know this gas chromatography is going to be done? This is an early stage project and the time scale for its completion is further than the time scale for NASA mission planning. So it's, there's no definitive, but for example, if it had been available 20 years earlier, the current rover on Mars, I, I would argue, could have benefited greatly from such an instrument. But that means that there's a good chance that Carla will see this happen. Uh, yes, I, I'm rooting for that. <laughs> Okay, okay, so, so your experiment could be the first one to find, you know, conclusive evidence of life somewhere else. Yeah, right? I, well, there's, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of other projects that um, work on this. That's one of the things about the next, um, the next life that you guys are going to be doing, the definition of life, and what is life. So we're just working with this biomarker, this biosignature of life, but there's a lot of other things that could really make us identify or help us um, understand what's beyond our earth. Let, let me just, before we're gonna to go to questions here in a moment, but let me just ask you, Carla, uh, something about the experience of being an REU student, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> since your mentor, Dave, is here on the line too, uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to try and be candid. I mean. You've been working on this for a couple of months. Uh, you know, has it been interesting? Have you learned things? Well, a lot. <laughs> um, I'm extremely grateful for this whole opportunity. 
uh, before this, I was just working on, well, I, I was given the opportunity to work on other projects, but they were most mostly based on um, energy storage, energy production, um, all of this with nanomaterials. And it, it was a very interesting topic until, well, I really thought that that was going to be my career path until I got into this entire world of astrobiology and you know, last minute cons considering my career right now. <laughs> okay, Carla. So, so what it sounds like is that, you know, 20 years from now, when they invite you to Stockholm because you were the first to find life somewhere else, right? Uh, you can say that this experience, this research experience for undergraduates, since you still are an undergraduate, was a, a kind of a turning point. Yeah, it's, this is my first opportunity outside of Puerto Rico. So I'm very grateful to actually share my experiences and where I've come from and to actually learn more and share what, I, what I've already learned. So it's, it's been a great experience and getting to know other students, other beautiful women in the career of STEM, it's, it's been amazing. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. All right, we're going to go to questions here, but just a few words to, to the audience, uh, which uh, seems to be, have a lot of people from the UK. I'm not quite sure why that is. Maybe because it's uh, dinner time in the UK and people, you know, they're thinking of their, their, their oleatic acid content or something like that. But in any case, there's another SETI Live today, actually, that will be taking place in uh, a little under four hours, I guess, three and a half hours from now at 2, 2 p.m. Pacific. And uh, one of the people that works up at the Allen Telescope Array is going to be talking with his students uh, about what's going on at that array. Uh, of course, we're looking not for amino acids or anything like that. We're looking for signals that might tell us that there's not only life out there, but it's life that's reasonably clever. And let me also remind you that this is coming from the SETI Institute, which is obviously a research organization, but it's also a nonprofit research organization. So if you would like to help both the research and our opportunities to, uh, to mentor young people who come to the Institute, uh, I hope you'll get in touch by going to SETI.org. That's the website, S-E-T-I dot O-R-G. All right, uh, here are some questions. I'm just gonna read them to you and Carla, you do your best uh, to uh, you know <laughs> get, get these people straightened out here. Uh, has anybody tested the atmosphere on Mars to see if chemi uh, chemicals in the winds there can carry life, if there might be life in the winds on Mars. Uh, do you want me to take this, Carla? Yeah, I think there's a lot of things um, involved here. <laughs> the Viking rover tested the soil. And the results of that and our later understanding of where life can live have led us to believe that the surface of Mars is currently uninhabitable. And much of the soil would have contained dust from the atmosphere. And so it would have been seen, if there was life there, it would have been seen in Viking. And now I know people have heard about Viking's life experiment, and, and it's considered, it technically worked, and it's considered that it was, it, it with other experiments, was con ruled, considered to be negative because of a, uh, how it worked. So, but the an basic answer is no. I mean, the surface of life is considered to be uninhabitable. And that's one reason why we look for past life on the surface. We want to look for extant life on Mars. That's a quite a bit more of a long shot and we'd have to be able to drill several kilometers down into the crust to do it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, no life. The answer, my friend, is not blowing in the wind is what you're <laughs> saying there. Is that right? Okay. Well, yeah. well, well, that's interesting. I mean, the, the whole tactic of NASA's search for life on Mars has kind of changed since the Viking landers. That was in the mid-1970s, as I recall. But, you know, now they're not looking for life that's still well alive. They're looking for life that's dead. And uh, that may sound a little less interesting, but on the other hand, it might be easier. I mean, you think about if you're looking for humans on Earth, right? Uh, there have been roughly 100 billion humans who have ever lived, homo sapiens, on Earth but most of them are dead, right? There are like 7 billion that are alive today. So if you were looking for life on uh, Earth, maybe it would be better to see if you could find the bodies, uh, something like that. And Carla, let me give you another question here because uh, 
uh, there, there are quite a few here. Is it possible that there could be signs of some sort of life in the atmosphere of another planet? Maybe this is somewhat related to the last question, but you know, we can sample the atmospheres of other planets. Could we find something that tells you that there's something alive there? Yeah, of, of course. Um, the universe is, as we understand it, is constantly expanding the possibilities that one planet, at least one planet, could actually harvest um, molecules that might not have the same structures that we have around us or might not uh, follow the same criteria as life as we know it around us in planet Earth. Um, but the possibility is that just one planet near us could actually harvest molecules that can lead to life, not uh, structured life, not uh, like as small as uh, microbes and bacteria, but that could actually help start a process of life. That's a very big indicative there that we are really not alone around there. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, uh, when you read about this kind of an experiment, trying to find life at a distance, right? Uh, new instruments like the James Webb Telescope, for example, they, they might be able to find oxygen in the atmosphere, right? I'm not sure whether the, the person who's asking the question uh, is, is looking for that as a possible answer, but okay, so you could find oxygen. Anything you could find from, uh, you know, microbes other than oxygen? I mean, you need photosynthesis for oxygen, but Photosynthesis, you know, wasn't around four billion years ago, I don't think. Yeah. So, you know, how could you find those really primitive life forms? I mean, the, these acids aren't going to get into the atmosphere. So, is there anything else? Well, yeah, um, I actually I've with been working, uh, Dr. David Summers and I, we've actually been working on looking more into what really gave the origin of life around us and there's uh, we have a lot of um gases and elements that really constitute uh what we are not not really oxygen action is is one of them but we i mean carbon hydrogen uh sulfur there's a lot of elements that we know around us that give to life and the perfect conditions, the perfect temperatures, um, the perfect position in the solar system. It's, it, it takes a lot of things to harvest life because it, it, we're, we're very specific in our planet Earth since we know that it worked in the specific things that we have right now. So it, it, it could happen in other ways. We could identify it in other ways. But to actually get to find what we know has worked <laughs> well, Carl, is I a mean, big deal. Okay. What, what about, you know, turning this technique onto, I don't know, some rocks from uh, Northwest Australia, for example. There's, there's some rocks there that are really old, almost 4 billion years old, to try and find out, you know, when did life appear on Earth? Could, could you use this technique? Yeah. I mean, it, it's basically we are using Earth as um, a muse and what we try to find outside. So whatever, we can actually work with the same techniques and the same theory and the same um, structure of the project based on what's around us. Because if, it's, if it, it's supposed to work here first and then work in another planet. <laughs> Has anybody done that? Gabe, do you know? I mean, has anybody um, looked at these really old rocks? The problem with, we got a technique which detects markers for life that we believe broadly gen detects life. The problem is there is life on Earth. So it's hard to detect life. You take, take a really old sample, right? You, as you're carrying it, it's being exposed to, and it's been sitting there for 4 billion years with life going on around it. It's kind of, Kind of hard to separate all that out. All right. Okay. Uh, I will point out that as far as atmospheres of, of uh, other planets, NASA is very interested in this. And yes, there are, there are debates over which gases would be good. There's debates over whether we want to try and get reflectance off the surface, which means we don't just see gases. 
and the technology is not quite there yet, but we're just like one step away. Well, as anyone, here's another question. Has anyone created a master database of the various uh, uh, chemical compounds or reactions observed on other worlds that might indicate other life or active geology or other types of uh, biological creation. <laughs> they use the word creation here, but I don't know that they mean it in the, in the biblical sense. I mean, you know, something like phosphine, right? You know, do you expect to find that in another world's atmosphere if it has biology on the surface? Carly? Um, I'll do a bit again. There, the possible reactions on other worlds, we don't have a database because in fact it would include all reactions. We don't know enough about other worlds to say what reactions would and wouldn't occur. There are, however, databases of, for example, reactions that might have led to the origin of life and people with a uh, uh, computer uh, slant look through these and try and pull possibilities out of that. And there's databases of, of biomarkers. We like fatty acids, but in fact, there are a lot of people arguing about which are the best ones to look for. All right. All right. It, it, is, is it possible to detect, here's another question, uh, Carla, is it possible to detect chiral molecules in the atmospheres of exoplanets? I guess the idea, for people who don't know about chiral, don't, don't give away the answer, Dave. Uh, the, the thing about <laughs> chirality is that certain molecules, right, that are the basis of life or are involved with life on this planet are left-handed instead of right-handed. In other words, you can tell the difference. The molecule is chemically the same, but it's either left-handed, like your hands, you can use your hands for pretty much the same things, but you know, they're left hands and right hands. If you could detect that, you know, all of a certain molecule were either left or right-handed, that might be an indication of life. That's been suggested. What, what about that, Carla? Could you do it? Well, yeah, it's, it's not that easy that we could do it. Yeah, the, <laughs> um, probably not yet gases. And basically what we do have at the moment it's more based on spectrometry, spectroscopy. So we really rely a lot on gases right now and how we can um, detect them. But the time might come soon. <laughs> well, all right, I've got to, let's see, run down the list of questions here. Here's one that we might finish up on because uh, this is one that you know, is certainly intriguing. Could we find DNA using this technique, right? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I currently I've, I've been, um, we had a talk a couple of days ago um, that they've been using ATP to actually um, sort of monitor how much that affects um, instead of Enceladus plums. And a, a, ATP is, is one, um, I think it's part of the RNA, but it's, later there but yeah you could you could really detect i i guess you could really detect um yeah genetics in there <laughs> well atp now atp for people who don't know all these chemical acronyms isn't that uh, the molecule that is responsible for you know producing energy out of the food we eat is is that right i mean you know you have a burger but then you, you can walk around the block or maybe walk around a hundred times I mean, ATP is involved in that process, is it not? Yeah. No or yes? I, I think it's so. It's the end product of the process. Okay, the end product you of the process. You make ATP, but you use sugar to make it. Okay, so if you found ATP, you would say, well, their metabolism, uh, you know, uh, must be somewhat similar to ours, but I guess the important point is that they have metabolism at all, that you have this compound that normally wouldn't be there except for life. Yeah, I mean, but by the point that we actually get to um, detect this, it, that's, I think it's a little bit bigger than actually finding fatty acids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I, we're, we're going to have to go baby steps here. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose. I mean, if we find this, we'll go ballistic. <laughs> okay, so that, that would be, <laughs> all right. So that's not just finding life, that's finding, you know, an advanced product of, of yeah. life, if you will. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think we're going to finish up here, but uh, Carla, what, what are your plans? You're going back, of course, to Puerto Rico to uh, be a senior. Uh, yeah. And then after that, what, what do you have any idea what you'd like to do after that? I really, I 
always wanted to go to grad school, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think I'm just, well, I, I don't think I know that I'm just going to work this last year and start applying to grad school. I'm actually considering to follow um, astronomy or um, chemistry just to sort of uh, apply, but I really want to follow um, the steps that Dr. David Summer has has taught me about astrobiology and get to be and maintain myself in this circle, in this community. <laughs> That's terrific. I have to say, you know, you talk to professors with, ten well, all professors have some sort of tenure, you know, uh, and sometimes they talk about their research, but very often they talk about their students. So I, I, I suspect that might be the case here. So you're going to go on with this, you're going to make a career in this field. That's terrific. All right. Well, we're going to say goodbye to all of you. This has been SETI Live uh, from the SETI Institute. And once again, I encourage you to go to our website, SETI.org, SETI.org. And uh, you can find out lots more about what we do here. And not only that, you can actually help out. So uh, uh, I want to thank you for that. And don't forget that uh, this afternoon at two o'clock Pacific, which is a little over three hours now, there will be a, another SETI live. And this one, uh, no, it's a SETI, what is it? It's a SETI, SETI talk. Uh, it's, yeah, the SETI talk is today, I think at two o'clock. Uh, and, and that will be on the definition of life. Is there really a definition of uh, life? People point out, it's not like water. You can say the definition of water is H2O. That's all you need to know. Now you know it's water. But life, we just describe a bunch of properties that most life has, but not all life. So uh, stay tuned for that. And thank you very much for coming to watch our SETI Live. We'll see you next time.